Hey everyone, welcome to Cloud Masters. Today we're joined by Eduardo Mota and Sasha Heyer. Eduardo is a senior cloud data architect specializing in AI and ML, but more importantly, what did he do in the past? One, he was a former head of ML and DevOps at Terramare, which is a clean tech startup leveraging AI, former SRE, former senior TAM at AWS, with an emphasis on language processing and SageMaker. Also uh, developed DevOps AI strategy at PayPal, Sasha, another senior ML engineer at Doit, Google developer expert, Google Cloud innovator. He has been uh, helping, I think, over 300 customers now grow in the field of machine learning. Tons of machine learning articles on Medium, follow him, and ML videos on YouTube, follow him. All that to say, um, I think we have the right folks in the room to talk about today's topic, which, which is observability in Gen AI. Um, specifically, uh, we're focusing on Google Cloud today. Um, why don't you, one of you, one of you guys kick us off and let, let's just kind of, uh, put the basics down. What is observability? Let's define that. And why is it so important with regard to gen AI, right? We, we know, we know it's a, it's a hot topic in general, but specifically around gen AI, maybe emphasize why it's so important. We, we integrate a new system, right? Um, every time that we, we have interaction between system, we should take a look at how the, the systems are interacting. And the best thing that you can do is have uh, metrics uh, and observe how the latency, the, the responses that are sending back and forth. Now, with Gen AI, we have this nuance that the output is not deterministic. The input and the output is not deterministic. So the input can be anything depending on the use case and the output can be also anything. Uh, in the regards of text, or in regards to images, or in regards to audio. So even if you send the same input, you're going to receive a slightly different output every time. And so observability becomes even way more important to be able to understand how that output and how your systems are interacting with each other. And there is a lot of other components that we may get into it, but at a high level, that is one of the nuances of Gen AI, having to... Um, see the end-to-end -end from what the end user is, how the end user is interacting with the, with the model to how the model is providing the answers, what is the, where the answers are being provided. Uh, and that's right now super important for many different reasons among security, uh, reliability, uh, ethics. Uh, that is a huge part now with Gen AI on ethics. And so being able to have that insight gives you tools to iterate and get better. So deterministic, like the example is I could ask the same question to the same model, I'll get two different answers. Some, Basically, like, I mean, you get the same idea, it, right? You will get the, uh -huh. like as humans, we're able to understand that they are the same idea, but the actual words are different. So you may ask, hey, can you give me an advice on how to, uh, uh, how do I just spend a hundred dollars? and how can I budget out of it? You get one response. You ask, you click, or you send the request again, you're going to receive a slightly different response. So you cannot just be looking for a specific tax, a specific words, or anything like that. In the past, with, uh, with metrics uh, in other systems, you're looking for that error word or a debug word or a specific word that indicates that something is wrong. But with Gen AI, really, you cannot there is nothing that you can say, okay, I'm, I'm going to look for these specifically to tell me that it's wrong because the, the scope of what can be wrong is very large. What do we want to keep track of then in order to give us hints of that, of something maybe being wrong? Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, you want to start, you're going to start recording all that input and output, right? Once you have that output, there is going to be certain things that you're going to do. Uh, Sasha, I don't know if you agree with me, but a lot of the times with the output, you will end up having to parse it into another kind of like sentiment analysis, given that the output is very large. It's, and I'm talking about LLMs, right? Because that's one of the most popular ones right now out there. There is other Gen AI stuff that is out there, but once you have the output, you can be looking at uh, some sentiment analysis or put it to a, uh, a parser that understands what, like, for example, bad language is. Uh, like any profanity or any 
words that you really don't want to know. And then you'll be able to see, okay, what is happening. On the other spectrum, you have certain things, um, certain output that you may not want to disclose to the user because it's against internal policy. It may be given something that you don't want to share with customers. And so you will have to be looking for a specific, uh, how can I put it, a specific ideas. And, and really the best way to go about it is to use another machine learning model to say, what is the sentiment? What is the intent of this text? And be able to say yes or no. Uh, and if you say no, then ideally it's like, okay, I'm not going to send that to the customer. But even if you record it to be able to do analysis in the long term, that's going to be very useful uh, to see how the responses are, uh, are changing over time. And if there is anything that you want to step back and say, you know what, I, I need to change the one. I need to do something because he's providing an answer that I don't like. Uh, maybe the tone, maybe I need to change the way uh, I ask it for the prompt to change the tone, the, uh, the vocabulary, do something different. So you will be able to do all of that if you're recording that output as a whole. <laughs> I think this is a, this is an important point here. We, we have customers, um, where, where they as customers actually right? I, I got a really bad feedback response from your model. And how to keep how how do you keep track of this? You need to somehow track the session of the user. You need to log the input, the output, and only then you're actually able to validate what what happened, what went wrong, and find and figure out what you can actually do about. It. Maybe you need to adapt your prompt, and maybe you need to choose a different model. But you need to keep track of all this information, like input outputs, um, in addition to what we anyway track, like errors, hard rate hard utilization, response times. But yeah. With the AI, we have this additional layer on additional information we need to keep track of. Right, because not every user is going to say, hey, I didn't like your output. They're just going to stop using that tool or, your, or your, that feature or your app completely. Um, is, is something like cost per request, that's also kind of a metric you'd measure? Or is that something that's more FinOps oriented? Uh, we did an episode on the costs of LLMs in production. Sasha, you were part of that. And I think that was something that they touched upon but I'm wondering, um, is that is that an observability metric, something like that? Yeah. If you put LLM into production, um, you need to justify this to your business. Somehow needs to approve the budget for that. And for that, you need to put a number behind your users. How much does it cost per user? And for that, you need to keep track of how much actually you, you spend per user. And this is something which is out of the box, um, not supported by, by most of the cloud providers. And um, it would be great if we could just use tagging and for each request, we could send a tag and this way can get the cost out of it, but it's not how it works at the moment. So we need to store this information ourselves. Customers do this, do this by implementing a wrapper, for example, and store the information in BigQuery, and then they can run their, their own analysis. Or we use tools like we had with, with uh, in one of the latest um, podcast episodes where you can put a wrapper around it and save yourself some time and use frameworks out there. We can keep track of that. We're, we're talking about Google Cloud specifically today because it's kind of just a wide landscape across across all the clouds. But um, do do they support? I know they have observability offerings. Have those already been kind of adjusted to support the measurement and tracking of some of the metrics that we talked about? I will say to a certain degree, <clears throat> given that um, their observability has been happening across many different workloads for different services, uh, you can adopt that. But there is still a big gap into how you measure all of these different things. Um, the, how do you measure the quality of the output? How do you uh, obtain feedback from the user with a, even with a thumbs up, with a thumbs down of the answer, if it's good or bad? Um, all these different things is a brand new field. Because Gen AI just took everybody by like, surprise, like, not by surprise, but like really by storm. And so there is a lot of catching up to do. And there is a lot of finding out like, oh, we should be doing this, we should be doing that in order to get into, the, into how uh, these workloads are happening. Um, the good thing is like, for example, with Google, uh, you are able to implement a lot of these things yourself to be able to give you insight. And a lot of times you may want to do that to give you really what you're looking for in the specific use case of your workload. Um, so using things like open telemetry uh, to be able to create traces in your system, it's uh, it's quite useful to, to understand how your requests are going across the systems. And it's rare that you're only using the Gen AI 
on its own, right? Like as an API, you're integrated with a larger ecosystem. We are putting other measures around it, maybe a chatbot, maybe a couple of requests. Um, we have now rack systems, agent systems that are interacting with multiple systems in order to enhance the experience with a with their LLM. And so there is a lot of different things happening when you submit one prompt. There's a lot of multiple systems being called in the back end. So having these traces and having this observability helps. And with Google Cloud, um, you you can get some, and then you have to implement another set on your own. Another set like of, the of tools? Of, of traces. Tools, so like, or like metrics that you want to generate. Sounding, sounding kind of like this is a bit of a, a never-ending cycle, right? So um, both with analyzing the responses um, yourself, uh, you, you mentioned setting up a whole nother cluster, a whole nother um, ML solution to analyze the output of the previous one um, and, and analyzing the metrics, the same sort of thing. So do we then need someone to monitor the monitors? Like, does it keep on going? Do we keep diving that's deeper? A, that's a, you're right. It's a... It seems like a like an inception type, right? You go in and then in and in and in with layers. Um, I think from from where where I have seen is that using you can use other LLMs to monitor LLMs or to control output or whatnot. But that becomes complicated as you were saying, Sam. Like it's just like an inception cycle, right? Uh, if you more if you use more deterministic uh, models like a deep neural network. Uh, the model is a lot smaller and it's just a classification or a sentiment analysis that have different threshold. You have even more control over that and you stop that bucket being like, okay, you have to monitor the monitor and be able to do that. But that's a problem that we have in the industry across. I remember being a CRE and we are monitoring the the um, the workloads in compute and all of a sudden we're not getting alarms and we're like, okay, what happened? And we noticed that there was an issue with the monitoring tool. And so it's like, do we need a monitoring tool for the monitoring tool so that we know when that stops working? And so I think in regards to that, I, I, don't, I think that we haven't been able to solve it completely. Do we also find an answer? How do we ensure we receive the right, like the metrics all the time, right? I mean, the cloud providers a great way to do this because it's, it's managed services a lot of the times in the observability area. And so there is somebody else making sure that those systems are, work, are up and running. <laughs> Obviously, I'm being a little facetious, you know, um, sure. just for the, for the sake of the podcast. But, I mean, it does, it does sort of link me back to the idea of user feedback. You know, you quite often see these viral posts going on, on Reddit or Twitter about how, um, sorry, X, it's not called Twitter anymore, um, about how someone's put some sort of prompt into a, an LLM and come out with a very funny result that was certainly unintended. Um, the most recent one I, I saw this week, uh, funny depends on your point of view, but it was about the um, the founders of the US being uh, African American or something like this, right? That's driven up a, a storm on Twitter. Um, but then the user feedback on that, when lots of people give the thumbs up, the positive, then that obviously tricks your algorithm and throws everything out as well, right? And ruins the quality of your data, which which, which is a genuine thing that people need to try to figure out and, and to work on. I was going to say, like any input that you receive in any system, you need to parse it, right? And that's even feedback that you're receiving. So <laughs> as a, uh, that's always a good idea. Um, anything that you receive from a customer, never take it with the with the trust um, because ninety percent of the people are going to be using the system the way you intended to. And is there always that small percentage that can take advantage of a system? And so you just have to be sure, right? You just have to. You mentioned RAGs early, and I was going to clarify with you the differences between RAGs and LLMs. And it it seems like, I, I think it's that LLMs generate responses from what they've learned, while RAGs go and retrieve relevant information first and generate a response based off of that. And is that a, like, if one, is that correct? And two, maybe if you, is there anything like to elaborate on those differences? I'm just kind of simplifying it because I'm less technical here. The, the basic between an LLM, LLM is basically answering the questions based on what the model was trained on. This could be also outdated data, right? Um, because the time goes on and data model was trained on getting, getting older and older. But it could be also just 
um, missing data, your company internal data. This is where usually then you take a, a rock approach and retrieve an augmented generation, fancy name for just saying, hey, here's my data, um, please do something based on top of it. So you build a vector database, you transform your text into a vector and you put all those documents into a vector database and then you can retrieve them and enhance the LLM to answer best, uh, questions based on those documents, um, which is an, again the next step of um, how, of, of um, traceability or um, how you can keep track of those embeddings and the, the documents you're re receiving because then the, your model is based on the documents you're receiving. So you need to ensure that this is actually correct and this is also something you need to keep uh, track of. What kind of documents did, did we receive? Um, is this the right files to answer this specific question? Um, so this is also something which we should keep track of. And going back to uh, going back to you know away from rags and more into kind of just Gen AI, and we talked about Google's offerings and stuff. Um, I think they're I think they're on their 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 final name now, a Gemini, but. How does how does all of this work with with their APIs that connect to like their Gemini models? So when you're talking about um, APIs, you know, like even though you're within Google, uh, there is limited information that you're receiving back from the, mm -hmm. the API, and so you will need to treat it as a as a third party API, right? How will you how do you when you integrate with other systems in a development software project? Um, you need to still observe that latency, uh, the way that which you're making calls, and whatnot, to be able to uh, give an overall uh, view of how your system is responding to all of that, how long it's taking to get a response. So, for example, we got a customer who is uh, using Palm to to be able to make calls, um, and what they were doing is sending information, uh, requesting information from the from the LLM retrieving that information and then incorporating that into a video, live video, that then will be presented to the end user. The solution is a little bit more complicated, but I'm simplifying it. And the, it is quite important to understand the latency, right? Because it has to be, it's a live video that be generated. And so the audio and the video have to come at the same time. And so one text Python or Palm 2 is replying, it's sending the response. It's like, how long is that taking? How long is it taking from the moment that we send it to the moment that we receive it? Um, and it was quite important. We we noticed that month over month, and as the system started increasing activity, there were um, an increase in latency from 1.5 seconds to three seconds, which seems like not that big of a deal. It's 1.5 second increase. But when you're talking about live video, then you're looking at the mouth going this way and the audio going somewhere else, and it looks like a really bad subtitled movie or like soft movie. So that's a really bad experience, right? So how do we increase that? And just monitoring that helped us understand that there was a real limit that the customer was starting to hit. And so that we needed to work with Google to be able to uh, increase that li real limit in the system. And so that more calls can be placed at the same time, and the responses will be acceptable for the customer. So that is just like, one of the uh, scenarios where even though it's an API, even though you may not be getting a lot of information, just monitoring the latency is important to be able to ensure that the system integrates well. I.e. why you need observability or one of the reason one out of, I don't know, 24, why you, why you need observability in Gen AI when you're, when you're building out a Gen AI feature. I'm going to, I'm going to try to limit myself to saying that terms like 20 times on this podcast um i and i remember that i remember there's like if i'm thinking of all the offerings from google cloud right now before we kind of go into more more best practice space i just want to lay i want to get a lay of the land here um they also have something called ai platform now how does that differ from everything else that we just like they have cloud logging they have all these all, all these kind of tools for observability, they have APIs, and now you have this thing called AI platform. You have, and I forgot to mention, I don't know if it's called cloud logging anymore, but they've, or Google Cloud monitoring operations. Um, but now there's also this AI platform. It's actually called Vertex AI. AI platform was the old one, but some call it Vertex AI, AI platform, so. Yeah. I swear I wasn't <laughs> trying to set you up for it. 
it confused me. I was like, is that a new product? Like I just haven't heard of. No, it's Vertex AI. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's, uh, what is Vertex AI for versus everything else that we just got? And, and how does it play into observability here? So Vertex AI is a, a set of machine learning tools. Well, basically everything you can get about machine learning on, on Google Cloud is under the umbrella of Vertex AI. Could be model, uh, model surfing, model training. But also all the generative AI models, all the Gemini models and multimodal models and all the generative AI APIs are available there. And that's where you can get access to the APIs, where you have the UI, where you can upload your training data. So it's all under one big umbrella there. I was just going to say, like, the, the, the part for that, like, observability, how does Vertex AI fit into the observability portion of it? <clears throat> so we've been talking about a lot of the inference, right, when the model is in production. Um, but Vertex AI is not only about Gen AI, it's about machine learning in general. So there are certain situations in which you will fine tune your model. Um, there are certain zero requirements that you meet that you say, like, you know what, it's more cost efficient, it's better if we fine tune the model with our own data rather than using our rack system. And so Vertex AI helps you create these pipelines and be able to uh, export those metrics uh, to, to like cloud logging to be able to start seeing what's happening and just create a visual of your pipeline that you are fine tuning your model with. So that like helps uh, with other AI ML models. Um, it helps as well with a lot of other metrics um, like uh, on traditional machine learning, uh, the, the accuracy, the recall, all that fun metrics that traditional ML models will have. Uh, you're able to export that and have visibility of that. But yeah, basically, as Sasha was saying, it's a it's a platform, and then from that platform, you're able to explore and create more. Now we kind of covered that. Let's go into, you know, I I don't know what your what your customer count is, Eduardo, but it's Sasha is three hundred plus. But from from your encounters with helping you know customers that do it, maybe even before him, what are your rules of thumb or best practices around implementing observability in Gen AI? You know, maybe even specifically to Google Cloud as well. Yeah, I can cover some of my best practices. So I usually recommend to start what you already get out of the box from, from Google Cloud or Vertex AI. So if you host your models there, you get the metrics like um, how many requests you get per second, how many of those requests actually run into errors. This is what you get out of the box. Start with that. It's a really good starting point. If you see you running into any kind of, of errors, you know I might need to look into the logs to see what, what happened there. Maybe you can correlate it to something which happened in your business, like Black Friday, Black Friday sales and stuff like that. That's where you start. And from there, if you're figuring out you're missing information, then um, gradually add this information. Maybe you need to implement a custom logging, which stores your prompts into BigQuery, but it's not easy. And over time, if you miss information, add this to your own logging on observ observ observability systems, whatever you're using there for, for, track, for keeping track of this. From my side, I will say like, I I'm, I'm come from the DevOps world, as you mentioned, Matt, and I'm a CRE. Uh, think of observability even from the POC level. Uh, a lot of times we start like the POC level and it's internal, so there is not a lot of worry about observability. So thinking about it then, because that's going to translate into being part of your product as you go into production or start using it at a scale. Um, and you start using, like, even when you start using it in test scenarios, start getting those metrics. Metrics with even 10 users help uh, start driving where you are going to be changing the the, the model and the workload, and making adjustments and making improvements. So, um, that is something that uh, I would suggest to keep doing even from even when you are in a very small scale of the POC. It's one of those things where if those if there's smoke in dev, there'll be fire in production. Exactly. Yeah. And also I imagine it's, it'll help in, in predicting kind of what your needs will be when you need to scale your Gen AI apps. Exactly. Uh, you're still getting a benchmark, right? Uh, of how the system is, is, is uh, behaving. Uh, because a lot of the times it's like, oh, I want this to be faster. And it's like faster than what? Um, and that's where you like, okay. And taking a look at where the benchmark is, uh, where you are comfortable with, and then as you're scaling, then you have a target to go to after. You know, in a perfect world, everyone implements 
the best practices that you talked about and does everything right. But in reality, what challenges do teams that you've encountered face when trying to implement this? And and what can they kind of do? What can they do about it? The biggest challenge is we have a lot of customers. They are not only using Google models. They are also using OpenAI and other open source models. And they frequently change between those models because maybe a new model is released. They want to give this a try. Maybe they put this into production. And if they implement those logging capabilities themselves, they need to also ensure that it's actually um, implemented in a way so you can take it from model to model and make this more generalizable. But this is something where a lot of companies now start to invest in either using open source products out there on the market or implementing their own in-house solutions, which also work well on different cloud providers, different models, different kind of um, frameworks and uh, libraries or APIs. The other challenge that customers face is like, we, we can talk about recording the input and recording the output to be able to get. And this is a lot easier done in development or in staging than it is in production, right? You have, there may be a scenario where you have thousands or, or millions of requests coming in. And anybody, anybody who has dealt with logs in a web application, that was how that can grow really fast. And with LLM, you have like these really large outputs uh, or really large input as well. So how do you keep track of that? How do you ensure that you are getting the right information and that you're saving it while being cost conscious and not just storing terabytes of data and do that? And there, you can take a look at some strategies to be able to do that. You can do some random sampling on that. You can take a look at what the thumbs up or thumbs down from the response from the user and then capture only those. Um, but at least on the dev side, on the testing side, do capture everything because that's going to be a, a smaller workload and that's going to give you a good indication and catch things that um, may, people may not have think of. Right? In previous episodes, um, you know, in one previous episode we did on uh, cloud bill red flags, kind of like what are what are some anti-patterns that you might see reflected in your cloud bill and what to do about it. One of the things that we that was mentioned was um, don't overlog. And so do you find that there's, uh, at least and especially like don't log for everything that you're logging in production in depth. So is there kind of a balancing act there? You know, we talk about it's, it's look for the signs in depth, but you know, what are the, specific signs that you can log a lot of things. So how, how do you reconcile those two things, those two statements? I think there is, a, there is something to be said about the actions of the user in Gen AI. Like some of you were mentioning at the beginning, what if the customer just stopped using the app? Well, that's kind of, that can be a signal. That can be a signal, or if the user is asking the same question multiple times, that can be a signal that they are not getting the response that they are looking for. And so, when you take a look at there, there can be other metrics that can help you trigger without actually having to monitor every single word that comes out of the LLM. Um, so the amount of retries, the amount of interactions, how many calls per user you're making, and you will start seeing some anomalies around that. Um, and maybe you do that and you combine that with, a, instead of logging the entire output, logging only the, 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 the subject of that output. What is that so that can you can correlate? Hey, this customer is asking too many questions, or do we are seeing a high rate of retries for a subject on, I don't know, uh, pants uh, sales questions because we're in a re retail, right? And you're like, okay, what's going on in that line? And you can start investigating and get into more detail and start enabling more logging for that particular event rather than being a sea of information and you're like, okay, I know something's wrong. I just can't navigate all of this information that we're getting because it's just too much. So look into other metrics uh, to help um, enhancing production. That being said, that's where dev and staging helps you, right? Because you're going to be able to have a small, small number of data set for the login and be able to start correlating these other metrics and say, like, oh, when this retry goes up, that means that you're getting bad responses. Okay, instead of logging the bad response, I'm going to start monitoring this other metric, which is a lot easier and it has, it's a lot smaller. Great. So bo both things can be true then. That that overlogging, you can still, there's there's kind of a compromise that you can make there. 
Yeah. Some examples that you just gave. Sam, you always like to weave FinOps into these episodes. And, you know, we kind of hinted at this, but it does sound like we can also use some of this observability, observability metrics to then, you know, impact or to, to basically optimize our costs, see what, what, what can be optimized, where the problems are. Um, we talked about cost per request, but like, what are the other things to, to look for here when it comes to, to gen AI models and anything that any, any customer cases that you can relate to without naming the customer? Yeah, we had, we had one use case where, where we actually, a customer wanted to um, let their customers pay for what they are using. And for that, to, for that you need to keep track of, of the usage on an on actual user level, on, on their customer level. And it's something yeah, you, you need to implement. And as I said, it's not only to give it, to, to have your own pricing based on that, and, but also to make um, business, decision, business, decision, business decisions, see how, um, how which of your customers maybe needs a bigger tier because you also want to be competitive, you want to still make money. And if you're offering LM solutions, they can be quite um, expensive depending how you're using them and what your customers can do with it. Um, but you need to be cautious about it because yeah, you still want to make money out of your own business. So that's that's very important to keep track of. I remember when Intercom, which is kind of like a chatbot solution, um, they introduced AI into their product and they, they had special pricing where at least it was it was I don't know if it's you know it's more normal now, but this is when Chad GBT was first taking off, but they're they're charging 99 cents per resolution. So it's kind of like they're putting the cost on the customer there, but they're really defining it really well. And so I guess they have to then monitor their own, how much, how much does it cost us to help customers, res, you know, resolve tickets and, you know, what's our profit on that? And I guess they've nailed it, but um, that's just something, I don't know. Do you know any other customers that kind of implement this kind of pricing around an AI specific feature? Versus, instead of just bundling it with everything else? Yeah, some of the customers that offer this the special pricing. The tricky point is how, how do you figure out what, what is a good pricing? And a lot of customers, they, try, they start with some early, early stage users, just a small group where you roll out this feature. They sometimes can also use this for free during this time. And this way they can see what is, this, what is a typical spend, how much uh, are their users actually spending on those AI capabilities. And then they put a number on it and put it in production and it maybe works and maybe not. Maybe they need to adjust the pricing, but that's, that's how it works with pricing, right? It's, it's always something where you need to change. You, maybe you start with some pricing and you figure out it's too expensive, it's too cheap, or is it, you have the different pricing models and then you will need to change it, change it over time. And, and now, of course, we're getting to the, uh, to the advent or the, the, the bigger adoption of dynamic pricing based on AI. Um, Uber's been doing it for a while, obviously, um, with surge pricing and so on. But uh, I saw even this week, um, was it was it one of the fast food chains in America's? I think Wendy. Um, I, I thought I thought Wendy's. So. Yeah, I saw that, right? Yeah. So all the people with the munchies at midnight are going to be paying more for their burgers than they would in the middle <laughs> of the afternoon. Yeah, to be honest, I am I am very price insensitive at that hour if I'm out if I'm out, if I'm still awake that time. And, and AI will know that, so that's why <laughs> that's going to change. <laughs> so that's the dynamic pricing. And it's going to be interesting how that works. Yeah. That's going to actually play out. Yeah, and, and I, you know, speaking of starting, you know, I, I think about companies like Duolingo where they had a paid plan um, and they added a new one because they introduced two new AI, AI-powered AI features. They introduced, um, uh, what's it called? Somewhat, some, like basically... You can have a live conversation in that language to basically practice your conversational skills. I forget what they called it. Um, and also AI explainer, basically, why did you get this question wrong? You know, of course, I can just open ChatGPT and ask, you know, ask why I got this French conjugation wrong, why it's like this and not like that. But they're charging almost double on a monthly on a monthly rate. They're charging more than double their previous, uh, like their existing, their initial uh, paid plan. You know where it might be twelve ninety nine for that. They're charging twenty four ninety nine for the AI features, and I think annually eighty dollars more per year for the AI features. I don't know if people are using it or or not. They keep trying to give me three free days of it, but um, 
there may be a fraction of people that were paid that upgraded this and they're making a ton of money now and they're figuring it out. All right. So we covered, you know, some examples. There's a million examples now compared to even just three months ago to go over in terms of, you know, companies introducing this and, and just how they're pricing it, what they're probably looking at. You know, I imagine Duolingo, for instance, is looking at a bunch of things to make sure that, I don't know, they gave themselves a huge buffer with that, with, with 50, with the almost a hundred percent increase in pricing, at least on a monthly level for, for such a plan. But, um, I know intercom is pricing per X, which is per, per resolve ticket. Um, and we, we talked in the beginning about a gap in terms of what information we can get today, but where do you see things going with observability around AI? Maybe six months from now, 12 months from now, maybe beyond, maybe, maybe that's too short of a horizon, but you tell me. I see a, a big rise of open source products out there, um, which integrate really well. And I, I guess, and I, I also hope that all the cloud providers, they um, also publish, release their own um, observability features around their solutions because, yeah, they know how this works at a large scale and you don't need to take care of implementing any open source um, functionality. So I, I hope you get this out of the box instead of every time figuring out which is the best open source product I can use at the moment. I just want to use the cloud cloud offering. And I think that is going to be a, an increase to go beyond the LLMs as organization starts looking at other use cases outside of like just text generation, like image generation, and then audio generation, PP generation. How do you monitor those ones, right? Which changes, changes from text generation. And that's going to be a big driver from, uh, from the security perspective. Like always, security, it's, it's becoming more and more um, an issue or like a presence issue with LMs and GenAI. And that's going to be a big driver to get observability. Sounds like another episode should do. Exactly. <laughs> although, although, Sasha, I think in the, in the context of, uh, of kind of LLM focused monitoring, uh, you know, we had, we had them as a guest They're, that's what, that's what, um, tensor ops is building, right? Exactly. Free advertisement. <laughs> so I guess if you're a VC, that's also a space. If you're event, if you're an investor, that's a space you also might want to, inv in to look at. Yeah, I see, I see a big market there. That's just true. And let's say, let's say I'm a company who is just going to dip their toe into the water with building something, POCing something using Google or in general, but use it for the sake of things, using Google's gen AI tools that we, that we covered, how would like, what's the best way to start without accidentally spending so much money, um, you know, learning things along the way, how would you recommend a customer do that? I think it depends on the scale of your POC. If you're running the POC just internally, um, it, it's hard to actually um, run, run out of money um, just by using it um, in, internally. But if you're planning to put your POC somewhere into production, you need to be more cautious about it, how people are using it. Um, you got everything right, um, but you, you get an understanding on what, what, is, what is the input, what is your output, because you're building this POC and you run some smaller tests and you get understanding about the pricing as well. And then you can do some estimations at least, figuring out how many requests we, do we expect and what is our budget for this, for this POC. Um, but yeah, you always need to keep track of, of your building. And that's why yeah, cost and, and anonymity detection, it's coming into play. Just getting information if just something running out of order. Um, and then you can have a look, maybe stop the POC if this is in production, someone is abusing it. Um, but yeah, you, you need to, you can do that over your building, right? Gemini Pro is free right now. Just saying, it's a it's a good incentive to do POCs right now. Yeah. Also, uh, try to use the managed services for for a small POC. By the the amount of the cost for a thousand character, it's gonna be a lot less than if you go with like open source, put in an instance, and like, oh, I'm gonna play with it for two hours. You really need a lot more to happen if you're used using a managed API. So, for the POC. Use the use the APIs and see how things interact with each other before you start evaluating what's out there. Are companies like uh, doing any strict waitlisting? Like, is it you know 
like the the like I think with Apple they did their their Vision Pro whatever they're calling it. They had like a limited amount of early adopters they're releasing it to or they're selling it to or they gave it to the test. Um, is it the same thing where it's kind of like release it to X customers, monitor your unit costs, make sure it still makes sense, then open the wait list for the next 20 customers or whatever, make monitor the costs and kind of gradually increase that way? Or is it more of a release to everyone approach and monitor your costs and hope you can catch something on time? I think it depends how large your user base is. If you're a company like Facebook, you'll probably roll it out slowly. But if you're a smaller startup with maybe 20, 50 customers, why not rolling out to all of them if you would like to? But it's always hard to keep track of, of feedback if you roll it out to all, all um, users. If you have a small selected group, you can invite them, interview them, get some initial feedback out of them, see is it something useful they can use. So it's not only about how how cost sensitive you are about your POC or about your product. It's also about the feedback you want to collect. So, so in any case, the observability becomes absolutely critical because if you're not tracking that, you don't know about your costs. And so we've come full circle back to, we have to put this in place. Now that we've uh, come full circle uh, and we've, we've kind of sprinkled customer examples because you guys interact a lot with them around these use cases. Um, but more so examples of, you know, those have been challenges, maybe mistakes made, but how about anyone, do either of you have a story in terms of, a because a customer implemented observability, they were able to catch X and as it, as a result, take action Y, which helped them. Yeah. I had a customer, they, um, put, um, the open AI model behind their chatbot. And people figured out this is actually a GPT-4, which is used there. So they decided they, instead of paying for their own GPT-4, they used the customer's chatbot to ask the same questions. And if, you, if you're not preventing this with a prompt or with, with identifying this kind of stuff, you, you open up for a lot of, lot of misuse there, just one use case I had with a customer. And so they, they, were, they were able to catch that because they put observability into place. In place. Exactly. They, they kept track of, of every user session as well. There was a, a um, big um, outlier, so a lot of requests compared to the other users. And this way they digged into the prompts with the, which the user actually sent. It was totally unrelated to the chatbot. They just used it for, for other purposes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's how good you're actually implementing your chatbot. But there are, there are always ways to circumvent the security you put into your prompt because, yeah, it's... It's not strictly following the prompts. If you can can intelligently work around it, then you can also use chatbots, customers chatbots to write you a book if you would like to. I should check that with our own internal tool, Ava, with our own customer customer facing tool, Ava, because I have three point five. So maybe I can get ChatGPT four results from using that, and then warn <laughs> and then warn our engineering team, of course. Just don't do the uh, the Air Canada example where they uh, some someone was. Uh, trying to get a um, help with a, a canceled flight or something like that. And Air Canada's chatbot turned around and said, this is the policy. This is how much money you should get, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the Supreme Court's now ruled, or the courts have ruled that they must pay uh, the, the amount that the chatbot said, even though it was completely wrong. It's like a, it's like a high-tech Pepsi, where's my, where's my airplane situation. <laughs> That's a good one. I had a customer who, um, using a rack system, right? the cost started growing up and it's like, how do we reduce the cost of this? Um, when, when we took a look, um, we needed to start first to kind of look at how much they were spending on the API. They were using an API, uh, like Gemini pro. So the cost of the Gemini pro itself wasn't too much, but the way that they were retrieving documents from the vector search was interesting. Because when we take a look at the, how they were storing the, the, the documents, it was these, these large match documents that were get crammed into the database instead of, so let me step back. Um, so when they were retrieving and sending it to the LLM, it was very large documents and they may only need a paragraph to part of that document that actually pertained to the question at hand. So they were sending these massive uh, document that really they had a lot of extra content that wasn't necessary. But 
it was hard to tell just from the get-go because it's just a system working, like putting everything together, sending it over, coming back. And it's like, okay, I started taking a look at the cost of every trace and we, we take a look at uh, the storage in the database and, this, and the retrieval. And like, okay, we need to break this down, make these documents smaller so that less data is actually being transferred and then being sent out. Um, it wasn't a huge amount because they were still in development, but we were able to, okay, let's change this before you go actually in production because then in production, then it's going to be significant. Sounds like the JNAI equivalent of doing a select star in BigQuery <laughs> exactly. versus, yeah, yeah. versus specifying a partition. <laughs> That's a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a good comparison. Yeah. So you need to ensure like with the risk track system that you are actually just retrieving the essential information in order to extend to the... I think that wraps it up for us. Um, I think especially I mean, a lot of people are in, are in the, unless you guys have anything else to say, but I, th I think the, the, the customer examples here are super useful because so many are still in experimentation mode. So it's good to have these anecdotes from, from companies that are deploying to production already. I will say just one more thing that we we tend to like it doesn't get talked about uh, in general because we're focused on the model, we're focused on the workflow and the interactions, but we're using rack systems or even fine tuning in certain cases. Monitor your data. Your data is very important and monitor it for bias. And um, we have these on large documents and you're using a lot of documents, and really nobody has time to go over three hundred documents before you say. LLM start using it and start treating it. So put observability of bias in your documents. There are frameworks that allow you to do that because the LLM will find trends uh, that a human may not have found. And so you may have situations like Air Canada where it's found, found a trend that is actually not realistic, or you may found a bias that um, wasn't there or wasn't in, an intended, right? Um, so just a quick anecdote that I read was one of the big retailers in the US delivering uh, products. They found out after analysis that there were certain neighborhoods that they will deliver the product last to preference other neighborhoods to deliver the product faster. So if you were in certain neighborhoods, you will get your product faster. And then in other parts, you will get the product um, later. And there was no particular reason except the zip code. So we're changing somehow the model picked up a trend to certain zip codes where less of a priority than others. And it's like, there is no personal information that was provided, but the model was able to find this pattern and then implement it, right? So you want to have observability in your documents as part of your rack system or as part of your in system when you are interacting with your systems or as an in the fine tuning phase. All these examples really hits it home, I think, you know, versus just us talking theory here. Um, but yeah, I think that wraps it up. I, I think we have a lot more topics like you, you, you hinted at security. You know, which we I think we're going to we're going to set up a, an episode about. Um, maybe it was some maybe it was a customer in the space that'd be cool. But uh, for everyone still listening to this point, I think it's almost been an hour. We hope you found this informative. I I think this is one of our better episodes, um, if not the best. So thanks everyone, and we'll see you at the next episode. Thanks everyone. See you. See ya.